Good morning, church family. Would you grab your Bibles and stand with me as we read God's word this morning? We're gonna start with our call to worship, which is just an opportunity for us to reorient our worship to God and be reminded that he is worthy of our praise and we look to him in all things. And so we stand even when we read that as reverence for God's word. Um, we see it as important and holding weight and value and, 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 and speaks into our life. And so we open ourselves up to what it has to say to us. And so Psalm 131 is, is a psalm of ascent, and it's a psalm that the Israelites would have sung on their journey to Jerusalem, on their journey to the temple, as they went to meet with God yearly in their pilgrimage. And so I'm going to read Psalm 131 over us, and then just have a few thoughts from it for us. It says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me, but I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. You see in other, other translations, verse one says, O Lord, my heart is not proud or not full of pride. It's not self-focused, primarily just focused on me and what I need and what I want and what I deserve, but instead it's humble, it's quieted before the Lord. And in, in verse two, it says, um, but I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. And the idea here is that the, the weaned child, the one who no longer needs milk or demands milk from the mother to be happy is now content in the mother's presence. It's just content with being with the mom and, and the word for us this morning is, and I've even had to wrestle with this through this season, is am I content with God and God alone? Am I content with just his presence and all that he's already offered to me? Or do I, like a small child, like a small baby who's not weaned from its mother's milk, do I still whine and complain and demand things of God? So this morning, the call for us is to, to calm, to quiet our souls, to remember that we have been given so much by God. And so we can come into his presence and we can hope in him again, not because of the stuff that he gives us, but because he himself is good and worthy of our trust. And so this morning, church, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Let's worship together this morning.
This is all for you, all for you, my God. And you are worthy, you're worthy. You alone deserve the glory. This is all for you, all for you.
this morning by just confessing our sins and our brokenness and our need for Jesus. We know that when we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And we want to be a people who are just quick to admit that we don't have it all together. And that's one reason why we confess together when we get together is because we're confessing that we don't have it all together, but we have a God who has met us in our need and our brokenness. And so we have nothing to hide. We can be completely honest about our reality and the brokenness in our own lives. And God does not define us by our brokenness. So we can confess freely knowing that we our love. And so let's confess together. There's going to be words on your screen or in your worship guide that tell you what to say. And that part will say people. And you'll read that along with me. I'll read the part that says leader. And let's confess our sins together. God of salvation, in Christ, you have done great things. Our hearts are filled with joy. By your power, you lifted us out of the wasteland of sin and brought us with joy and laughter into your kingdom. Salvation is your gift to us. But we confess that often we try to replace your gift with our own efforts. We try to complete what is already perfect. We try to add to what is already full. We try to earn what we already have. Forgive us our foolishness. Help us to focus on your grace. Help us to live grateful lives in return. For Jesus' sake alone, amen. Just spend the next minute, minute and a half, just in your home, just searching your heart, thinking, thinking about the areas of your life that you just maybe need to confess to the Lord. You need to say, Lord, I wanna give you control back over this thing. I wanna give you back control over this, this area of my life or just things maybe you've been convicted of this week and just confess those personally in this time to the Lord, knowing that he is faithful and that he is loving. And then we will get into God's word. We'll hear what he has to say for us today.
Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us in worship today. This week, I've been thinking a lot. I've had a couple of conversations where we've talked about um, just how crazy it is uh, that we can even like catch a ball or hit a baseball. Um, like just all that goes into that. Like I know that um, I'm a little bit nerdy, um, and I get made fun of that uh, for that a little bit. But um, like just think about like all the things that have to go into you being able to like track a ball all the way until you catch it or track it until you hit it with a baseball, right? Like there's scientists who are able to do this with a robot, right? But it takes like millions of dollars and years of work and teams of geniuses to be able to get to the point where a robot can do, you know, what, what three and four year olds are able to do now. Like whenever a ball leaves somebody's hand, right? Like your brain immediately like starts comparing uh, that to, to the hundreds of thousands of other things you've seen thrown at you over the course of your life or that you've seen thrown in like a sports environment or something like that, right? Like you immediately start thinking about like how fast that hand was moving and how fast the ball is moving and like sort of the arc that it's going on. And none of this is happening really like in the sort of the top part of your brain where you're thinking, having to think about every one of those things, right? It's just sort of happening somewhere uh, deep down in your brain and all you're thinking about is, I'm gonna try to catch that ball, I'm gonna try to catch that ball, right? But there's all these, I mean, think about everything that goes into it, right? Like, like, depending on how far it's going, you're determining, like, whether or not you need to move up to catch the ball or not, right? Depending on what it's made of. Like, whenever, whenever you look at it, if it looks like a racquetball, your brain kind of predicts how that thing's going to fly. If it looks like a wadded up piece of paper, like, you know that it's probably going to fly a little bit differently because your brain is automatically knowing there's, there's air in this room that's going to change the way this thing flies. It's going to slow it down a little bit, Right? And as it's coming at you, you're thinking about like, okay, how fast is that gonna hit? How heavy is this thing? Like, like you ever think about the fact that your brain sort of judges how heavy something is based on how, the, how you've seen somebody throw this thing and how it's flying through the air? And there's all these like, crazy calculations that are going on somewhere in your brain. I don't understand how it works, right? But it's based on the fact um, that you've seen this happen before. You know what to predict. You know uh, what, what each little thing that your brain is, that your eyes are seeing. You know what each of those things kind of means. And that's helping you to figure out, okay, where do I need to put my hands? And do I need to step up? And how fast is it going to hit? Do I need to get out of the way so this thing doesn't just, you know, bean me in the chest, right? And, and, and it's because you've grown up in this world, Right? Like, you're used to the, to the way this world works, to gravity constantly pulling on you in a, in a constant sort of force, right? You're used to, like, the laws of physics, and, and so whenever you know an arm is moving this speed, you can expect that ball to move in a predictable way, right? Like, that arch coming at you at a certain sort of angle, right? Like, you're able to predict those things because you grew up in this world. Your brain has seen, you know, billions of of seconds worth of data come through uh, so that it can start to say, this is what typically happens uh, whenever, and so I can figure out what it looks like for me to have, to have some success here and being able to catch the ball so I can throw it back to my friend and his brain can do the same thing and we can just keep going back and forth, back and forth. You know how this world works. This world makes sense to you, right? We're in the middle of a section um, this week, we're in, we're in chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew, and we're in the middle of a section where Jesus has been explaining to his disciples that there's a world, the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven, uh, where things don't make sense to them. It's not the world they grew up in. It, it's not what they're expecting. And so everything has been sort of flipped upside down. And, uh, you know, forward uh, is, is how you go backwards. To go down, you got to go up. If you want to live, you're going to have to die, right? Like there's all these things that are upside down in this kingdom world. And, and we're stepping back into another one of those stories here with Jesus as the disciples ask another question. Um, and, and Jesus sort of answers it in a way that we never really would have expected. This whole chapter here kind of deals with something that I, I think is really exciting and really practical. It's how human beings, how, how people in the church interact with each other, knowing that there's going to be times when we hurt each other and how we should deal with the fact that I may be prone to hurt my sister or my brother in the church um, and, and how am I supposed to deal with that? And knowing that you may hurt me in the course of us just being church together. And so what does it look like for me to walk through that with you? What does it look like for us to even sort of embrace the idea of forgiveness or to understand that at a basic level? But what Jesus is walking us into, and I think what the first question and Jesus' first response in this chapter helps us to realize is that this is a world we weren't raised in. Maybe some of us have been walking in this sort of kingdom life um, for a long time, but this is not a world we were raised in. And so some of this feels completely upside down to us. Our, our brain can't make sense of it. it uh, and, and so there's some of this that we've kind of got to open our eyes up to a little bit and say, maybe, maybe it, I don't see this the way Jesus sees it, and kind of be open to that. So let's look at Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 1. 
At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, sorry, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse two, and calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Let's stop there for just a second, right? Like, think about the question that they asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Like that question in and of itself, if you know much about the kingdom, if you know much about Jesus, you know that's the wrong question, right? It'd be like going to your parents whenever you were little and saying, hey, how can I become your favorite child if you've got siblings, right? Like that question in and of itself, how can I become your favorite child, doesn't make sense. Like it betrays the fact that you don't understand family because family doesn't want to answer that question. That's not, a, that's not a goal that family's trying to get at, right? At least not in a healthy family, right? And it, and it betrays the fact that you don't understand love because to love your siblings, your brothers or your sisters um, in the right way doesn't mean that you're not trying to gain some sort of uh, affection, some sort of you know, out or disordered favoritism from your parents, right? You wouldn't even want that if you sort of have an understanding of love, right? In the same way, uh, the disciples question here, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven sort of misunderstands what the kingdom's really about. And so Jesus doesn't immediately just sort of give them an answer about how they misunderstand things. He brings someone into their midst to help them sort of like change their whole perspective, right? We're turning the world upside down. We're changing the laws of physics again here, right? So he grabs, he, he, he calls over a, a child and he puts them in the midst, kind of an object lesson. And he says, unless you become like this child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This is what that looks like, right? Which would have been just a baffling idea, right? And typically, whenever we think about uh, this passage being preached, right, you need to become like a child. You need to have a childlike faith, right? If you need, to, you need to humble yourself like a child to become the greatest in the kingdom, right? Typically, when we talk about that, we talk about how, you know, children are inherently, uh, you know, humble, right? We, we, we assume that that's what this means, that children are humble, and so we should be humble like children, your children must be better humans than mine. Mine are not inherently humble. Uh, there, there's a lot of times where they're like just, like they're really pumped and proud and like sort of sticking their chest out, puffing, like excited about things they're doing. And, and you're like, man, you want a, a lot of attention. And I love them and I love giving them, giving them attention, but I don't know that it's always true that children are inherently humble. Now, there's some other things that make a lot of sense to me when I've heard this passage teach, right? Like um, the, the, the idea of like sort of a, an innocence, right? There's a little bit of a sort of a naive, like haven't been exposed to some of the like rough, difficult, corrupt stuff. And maybe they're a little bit more trusting, uh, right? There's a, there's a curiosity. Maybe sometimes there's kind of a pureness in their, in their questions. And so I think a lot of that, certainly, we, we could adapt that in terms of faith. But I think there's another aspect. Like, so keep all of that. If you've heard you know, other sermons, or if you've, if you've thought about that in that way before, keep all of that. That's, that's great. But I think there's another facet of this that we sometimes don't pay attention to, which is that in an ancient culture, children were of humble stature. Like, they were, they were lower in status. They were lower in worth than adults, right? And the Bible throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament places a high value on children. So the Bible sort of speaks counterculturally. But in a lot of ancient cultures, a child really wasn't worth much at all. It would often be the case that you didn't even call them male or female. You didn't refer to them by a gender until they were of marrying or working age, until they were useful. Because up to that point, you sort of, you sort of called them by sort of a, a neutral name, like, sort of, um, like, like as if they were a, an animal or an object. It would often be the case that you just really wouldn't consider their rights or their interests or their desires until they were able to, to contribute to a family business or until they were able to marry and, and bear children, right? And so in a lot of cultures at this time, to humble yourself like a child it didn't just mean, you know, to have like sort of a childlike wonder. To humble yourself like a child meant to put yourself beneath everyone else around you. It meant to be of lower class, of lower status, to have no real ability to, to, to direct your own fate. It meant you, you weren't powerful. It meant you weren't influential. It meant you weren't wealthy because you didn't own anything. All that belonged to your parents, right? And so I think there's another aspect to this that we have to see that, that makes sense with a lot of what we see in Scripture as Jesus describes what the kingdom looks like and what it looks like to walk in the kingdom, uh, which is that to be great in the kingdom 
actually means to be the opposite. Think about whenever James and John come to Jesus and ask um, if they can be uh, at his right hand and at his left hand in the kingdom. It's a similar question, right? They're they're assuming that Jesus is going to be number one whenever this new earthly kingdom, that's what they were anticipating, when this new earthly kingdom is instituted, they're assuming that uh, that he's going to be number one and they want to be number two at the right hand and number three at the left hand. They want to have that kind of influence They want to have reputation, they want to have status, they want to have access to the one who has power, right? So they're asking a really similar question. How how does Jesus respond? He says, no, 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 we don't deal with authority in the kingdom. We don't deal with authority and power the way people who are outside of God's house do. We don't lord our authority over the Gentiles as they do, right? Instead, in this house, if you want to lead, then you've got to serve. In this kingdom, if you want to be great, then you must become slave to all. Think about Philippians 2. It it talks about the same sort of language, to humble yourself as Jesus humbled himself on our behalf, right? This humbling in this sense is bringing yourself lower than those around you to to, to recognize your situation, that you're dependent on God. Do you have little power to save yourself or to control what's happening for you, right? You're not actually in charge of what's gonna happen in the next moment and the moment after that. You don't actually have access to the resources that you need uh, to be able to accomplish everything that you have regardless of what your bank account looks like. Uh, There's a way in which what Jesus is saying here is to become great in this kingdom. You've got to become like a child, right? Who's, Who's dependent on somebody else. And in this case, it's dependent on God, dependent on Jesus to do, to live, to die, to be resurrected, to show us what it means to live, to give us that access to God that we can walk in his presence, to be able to understand even what it looks like to live in a kingdom here, anticipating a kingdom coming with the return of, of Jesus, our king, right? Let's keep reading here a little bit, but, that, but I think that kind of helps us to, to see this isn't just about like a childlike wonder, though we can, we can hold on to that. That might be helpful for us, right? But it's also about sort of like lowering ourselves, understanding ourselves rightly in terms of what we need desperately from God. Look at verse five. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for them to have a great millstone fastened around his neck, be drowned in the depths of the sea. There's something about knowing Jesus. There's something about accepting who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, about understanding the gospel that that frees us up to accept those um, who are like this little one. Now, we need to understand there's a shift here. He's not just talking about children anymore. This isn't just a whole passage about how children should be led into church, right? Though that's a good idea. Right now, he's talking about, he's, he's taking the sort of like logical next step in this analogy, where he's saying, if you were one such child, right, that is, if you were one who has become like a child, who's humbled yourself so that you can uh, enter the kingdom of heaven, right? He's saying, if you accept those people who've humbled themselves, who've recognized that they're dependent on God, they don't have the power, the status, the influence, the resources that they need, and said they're dependent on their relationship with God, if you accept them, there's something, right, about, about the gospel that frees you up to sort of accept, uh, accept them in that way. To accept Jesus in that same way means you're also freed up to be able to accept people uh, who who are sort of at their most vulnerable, who've recognized that there's someone who's of a lower status, right? But then he moves on and he says, um, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, if you're not familiar with what a millstone would be, it, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? It's, this, it's a massive stone used as a mill, right, to be able to grind grain, right? So it's just a big, heavy thing. You spin it around, you put some grain in there, and it grinds your grain down into a meal or into a flour so that you can use it uh, for whatever you need it for, right? But it's intentionally large. It, it, it is by nature. It, it's only functional if it's really, really heavy, right? So Jesus says, if you harm one of these little ones, If instead of receiving them, as you would receive Jesus, right? If instead your actions harm them or cause them to stumble, cause them to sin, right? As they're they're on their path to follow Jesus. If you cause them to stumble, it would be better for you if you tied one of those millstones around your neck and then jumped into the sea. The idea is it's better that you would die by drowning than that you would hurt one of these people, one of these people who who are a part of God's uh, God's, God's people who, who are in the church. Listen, Michael Phelps, right? Like the, the, the story here is Michael Phelps couldn't stay afloat if he had one of these uh, millstones around his neck, 
right? There's no amount of strength, there's no amount of righteousness or self-righteousness, there's no amount of being a good Christian or knowing your Bible that keeps you afloat. What Jesus is saying is if, if your life is geared towards making yourself greater than those around you, right, uh, then it would be better for you to be drowned. He's warning them off of this kind of lifestyle, of trying to enter the kingdom, uh, sort of still operating as though the old way of the world exists. And that's where I think we're starting to, to enter into what Jesus is doing here, where he's sort of helping them to understand how this thing has been turned upside down on them, right? In, in the old world, in, in, in what the Bible typically calls the world, in, in a world that, that has like sort of these predictable um, forces and pressures, right? Governed by sort of a uh, brokenness, uh, people being um, untrustworthy, broken, governed by sort of, um, you know, having to get ahead to be able to be okay, having to be superior to others to make sure that you feel like you're okay in and of yourself, ha having to get from others to make sure that you're just gonna have what you need in that world, right? Then it makes sense for you to say, okay, what do I need to do to be great in the kingdom? Because that's how that world works. But what Jesus is saying is that this world, the laws of physics are completely different. In this world, if you're headed in that direction, if you're trying to do what is successful in that world, then in the kingdom, it, it only leads to misery. It only leads to tragedy. It would be better for you to be drowned in the sea than to try to live that way and harm people as a result. Jesus is saying, if, if you desire to be superior to others in this kingdom, and that leads to people being harmed, as a result of your, your lust for power, your lust for influence, your lust to be su superior to the people around you. This isn't gonna lead to success for you as it would in the world. In the kingdom, that only leads to destruction. He's gonna spell that out a little bit further here. Look at verse seven. Woe to the world, again, talking about this old world, right? Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Just real quickly, look what he's saying here. He's saying it's, it's, it's necessary, right? It's a necessary outcome of the way the world is that temptations are going to come. He's saying that you should expect, because this world is governed by things that are corrupt, that things are broken in this world, that you, that you can expect uh, that there's going to be temptations, there's going to be sin in this world. But that doesn't give you an excuse. That doesn't, say, that doesn't mean that just because you're a product of your raising, that, you're, that you were raised in this world, that then it's totally fine, it's understandable. You feel free to continue to act in a way that's consistent with this world around you. He says, it's necessary that temptations come. Maybe your version says inevitable, but, but woe to the one by whom temptation comes. Just because we're raised in this world doesn't mean we continue to act as though this world is the way we're ought to, we ought to live, right? We're called into acting, to living by these new laws, by this new way of living, by these new forces and pressures and realities of the kingdom of God. Verse eight, and if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with, uh, than with two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. That's a pretty dramatic image, right? This idea that like, if you're gonna get anywhere close to sin, if you're gonna get anywhere close to, uh, to temptation, right, then you should cut off a body part. You should be willing to pull out an eye to be able to protect yourself from that. Now, we need a little bit of context here, right? We've seen from earlier in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus doesn't believe that sin originates in the body part you use to commit that sin, right? So he's not saying that like sin is in your hand and so you cut it off and then you're free of temptation, right? We've seen Jesus talk about how that, that's, a, that's an issue of the heart, right? And uh, we need to recognize that what's being talked about here in terms of sin is, is the sin in context with what we've been talking about this whole time. It's this, the kind of sin that leads others to stumble. It's the kind of sin that harms others and, and, and maybe inhibits their path or pushes them away uh, right from the church or from Jesus. And so what he's saying here is not, um, okay, you know, if you're tempted, then cut off your hand and you won't be tempted anymore. What he's saying is, if, if you are likely to sin in such a way that you would hurt somebody in the church, hurt one of God's people, then do whatever is necessary to keep yourself from doing that. And to get an idea of, of what, what might be necessary, there's a, a scholar this week that I heard that was talking about how if you were to look at Proverbs, um, you'd get a better idea of what Jesus is talking about here. You gotta remember that Jesus is a Bible expert, right? He's a, he's a, 
an excellent rabbi. Like he knows the scriptures. And for him, the scriptures are the Old Testament. And if you were to go back and look at the Proverbs and you look at every place that you see uh, the word I pop up and the word foot pop up and the word hand pop up, then what you're going to see is that those things are connected with specifically sort of things that happen in our life. Your eye, right, is connected with how you see, right? How you see the world around you. How, do you, how are you aware of the people around you? Your hand is, is connected with what you do in life, your actions, your activities, right? Your feet are connected with the path of life that you're walking on, the way that you live your life, right? So think about it in that sense. Jesus is saying, if there's anything about the way you see the world, about what you do in the world, or about the way you live your life that might cause someone else to be harmed, remember, it, it'd be better for you to be drowned in the sea It'd be better for that, that, that to be radically changed than for you to suffer eternal fire. He's talking about hell here, right? There's no other way to look at it. He's talking about hell, right? It'd be better for you to, to, to radically change your life, radically change the way you see, radically change what you do, radically change the way you live your life rather uh, than, than cause that harm to someone else who is one of God's people, one of these little ones, one of these people um, in the church with you, with me. It, it, what he's recognizing here it's pretty inevitable, right, that, that there's going to be temptations, that there's going to be difficulties. We're raised in this world. Things make sense to us in this world. Just like you can predict a ball coming at you, like you're, you're designed, like you're, you're not designed, but you're built, like sort of you, you've been um, conditioned to expect and to predict and to respond to the pressures and forces of this world, of evil and corruption, to, to make you think certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And so you, you might expect that in this world of, of humans where we're living in church together, there's going to be people who are harmed. There's going to be people who are hurt. But what Jesus says here is, woe to those by whom temptation comes. We are not off the hook just because we're raised in this world. Instead, we're called to live as though uh, we're citizens of a kingdom, right? A kingdom that hasn't fully arrived, but yet still we are called to live as live and a part of right now. This is another one of those areas, right, where where the, the, the kingdom turns things radically upside down. The laws of physics seem to change here because it might seem right for us to continue to live the way we live, to, to use our feet the way um, this passage is warning us against. It might, be, it might seem normal for us to use our hands or to, to, to live, to, to make decisions, to have behavior right in the way we always have because that's the world we've lived in. It might make sense for us to see the world in the way that the world has trained us to see it. But Jesus is saying you need to do whatever is necessary to radically change because that's not how the kingdom works. See, in the kingdom, gravity isn't the dominant force in life. Grace is. Grace is the dominant force. It's the thing that keeps our feet on the ground whenever it comes to kingdom life. And many of us respond to grace really differently. It's a really difficult thing for us to deal with. And I think that's part of why Jesus has to say this because we're not naturally inclined to be able to take the way we see the world around us, the, the things we do in the world, or the way we live. We're not naturally inclined to say, yeah, I'll get rid of that. I'll amputate that out of my life for the benefit of somebody else. But grace permits us to see that if we can actually wrestle with, if we can actually understand what it looks like to receive grace. See, for some of us, the idea of receiving grace at all is really difficult. Like maybe we could receive it that one time, like early on when we first became a believer, grace is for, for new believers, and that's something we could accept it then. And maybe there's a few times in life when we think like, oh, you went through a really difficult season, right? Something really, really hard happened, or you were under a lot of stress. And so, you know, in certain seasons, maybe you can go back to get a little bit more grace. But just generally in life, some of us who just don't believe grace is for us. Grace is for other people. It's for new believers. It's for people in a difficult season. But for me, I've just got to get it right. I've got to work hard enough. I've got to know enough of my Bible. I've got to, to act morally enough um, that I'm going to be able to get this thing right. So I don't really need grace. And so it's really hard for us to accept it, to deal with it. And if we have convinced ourselves that grace is something we only need every once in a while and only for certain things, then it becomes a whole lot easier for us to justify not giving grace to other people and not doing what is necessary to sort of allow for the fact that our life might need to change dramatically for someone else, to, to allow them that grace, right? to allow them that mercy, to say, I, I, I don't want to harm you. I see your weaknesses. I see your difficulties. I see the things that might tempt you most, and that may be different for me. And, and so, so I'm willing to change things radically in my own life. It's a little bit like what Austin was talking about last week when we talked about, no, you don't have to pay the tax. 
but pay the tax. There's, there's nothing in here where, where Jesus is necessarily saying that the way of living, that the way of seeing, that the way of, uh, of acting is necessarily sinful or wrong. But, but what he does say is if it might harm someone else, even if it's okay for you to do, that you ought to be willing to amputate that, to cut it out of your life violently, brutally, if necessary, so that you might extend that mercy so that you might not harm someone else around you. But for some of us, if we can't accept grace for ourselves, then we certainly will not permit someone else grace. And we're just gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna live my life the way I live my life. And if you are gonna be harmed or tempted by me doing, doing my own thing, and I'm not gonna... I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna show any love there. I'm not gonna show any, uh, show any deference there. I'm not gonna change my life just so that you're not harmed as a result of it. There's, there's others of us, right? Uh, that grace is, it's not that it's hard for us to receive. It's that grace becomes this thing we sort of like lie down and flounder in, right? It, it, grace becomes this thing that sort of numbs us to any feeling that anything should ever change. Because if I've got grace, if, if God has forgiven me, if God has made me right, then why do I need to change anything? Right? We're sort of paralyzed um, by feeling like we're made okay. We've been forgiven. And so why would I need to change my behavior? Why would I need to change the way I live my life? I'm forgiven. I'm good. What needs to change? I think we see this a lot of times. Um, because, because we've been forgiven, we feel like that means we're not responsible. We don't have to take any accountability for the things that we've done. Like, there's sometimes whenever I hurt someone in my life, and then I may take that to the Lord and ask the Lord to forgive me or trust at least that the Lord has forgiven me, that his grace is sufficient even for that thing where I've hurt someone else in my life. But because I think God has forgiven me, then I think, well, well then I'm gonna move on from it. And so should that person. That's, that's not the way things work. Right? There's still consequences, natural consequences for our sins in the, in the world where we live now. And sometimes it's the people around us, the people that we love that pay those consequences. Grace doesn't mean that we no longer have to be accountable, that we no longer have to care about the people around us, that we no longer have to see how we might be harming or flinging shrapnel at the people in our life because we refuse to change. Grace frees us up. It says, you've been forgiven, you're okay before the Lord. And that, that's not changing, that's sealed in Christ's life, death and resurrection. And so now you are free to do whatever is necessary to be able to live into the life that God's called you to. Grace doesn't paralyze us, right, and keep us from change. Grace is what permits, what, what enables us to walk into that new life, right? But in both of these situations, we've got to deal with what it looks like for us to live and walk and see and act in this kingdom in a way maybe it doesn't feel intuitive to us. Maybe it feels like the laws of physics have changed. But if it's going to harm someone else, especially someone else who's in the church with us, um, then, then we've got to be willing, what Jesus says here, we've got to be willing to cut that out of our life. And the, the really harsh, really difficult warning here is that if we've got a life marked by thinking, I don't care who I hurt, I'm gonna live my way. I don't care how it causes other people to stumble. I'm gonna do these things. I, I don't care that, that the way I see people or the way I see the world around me or the way I see myself, I don't care that that blinds me to the damage I'm inflicting on the people of God. If that becomes a long-term pattern of our life, then it's evidence that, that we've never known Jesus at all. Like, like it talks about, uh, in verse five, whoever receives once a child receives me. It's because there's something about grace, there's something about being transformed by the gospel that helps you to see, to act, to live your life in a way um, that, that by being transformed by the gospel that would say, I'm gonna change so that I don't cause temptation, cause difficulty, cause damage for other people. And, and if, if that's not where we are, if that's a long-term pattern of our life, then we've gotta ask some serious questions about whether or not we're following Jesus at all. Because the alternative, right, is hell. Like to just put it real plainly, he's not sugarcoating anything here. In fact, he's going out of his way to sort of grab hold of our attention to shock us a little bit. It's better for you to enter life with one eye uh, than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Now, let's go on. Look at verse 10. We'll look at this last paragraph here. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my father who's in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go and search the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than, the, than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my father that who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
Okay, so back to this idea of little ones. Remember, we're not necessarily talking about children. We're talking about those who've become like children to become a part of the kingdom of heaven. That is like brothers and sisters um, who are in the church. And so he's saying, uh, do not despise one of these other like people who are in the kingdom, one of, the, one of these brothers or sisters in the church. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who's in heaven. And one thing that's really interesting, if you think back to other places that you've seen angels in scripture, particularly like Isaiah 6, there's these two angels that sit over in the, in the kind of tabernacle where, where Isaiah sees God. And there's these two angels and they have six wings, you may remember. Two of those wings cover their feet, two of those wings cover their mouth, and then two of those wings uh, cover their eyes. Um, and, and so it's really interesting here that, that, <clears throat> that what Jesus is saying is that in heaven, the angels um, that, that somehow belong to or represent um, these little ones, those who are the people of God, that their face always, that they always see the face of the Father. There's something different, right, about their access, about their presence with God. But I think whatever is going on there, I think the idea that's being communicated here, right, is that these people are, are not orphaned off. They're not forgotten. Um, what you do to them is not unseen, right? But that God cares dearly for them and has made sure that they're well guarded, that they're, that they're well, well overseen, right? And then there's that, that sort of beautiful picture that's, that, that we see um, sort of used over and over again in Christian songs and in poetry. I mean, it's a, it's a really common phrase, right? If a man has a hundred sheep, one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain, go in search of the one who went astray? He rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. It's not my father's desire that any of these little ones should perish. What we're getting here is a peak. We, we've been in warning mode, right? Where Jesus is saying, don't let this desire of your heart to be greater than those around you lead you astray in what kingdom life looks like. Because that desire to be greater than others is only gonna lead to them being hurt and to your own destruction. So we've been in warning mode. And now we get this little peek into the heart of the Father. That those who've been harmed in the church, those, those who are part of the people of God, who, who've, who've been damaged, who've been caused to stumble, who've been caused to, to, to sin as a result of people continuing to live this sort of kingdom, this sort of non-kingdom way, that God chases after them, that God's heart is to bring them back to the flock, that his desire is for the one who's gone astray. Maybe you can identify with that. My guess is that many of you um, know what's being talked about here. Like, like I'm thinking I'm probably not the only one um, who um, has scars and wounds inflicted by other sheep. My guess is that there are many of us um, who've been hurt and wounded and maybe pushed away, maybe felt like we weren't welcome um, among God's people. Not by necessarily by people who are other sheep, but sometimes by wolves in sheep's clothing who really aren't following after Jesus, who really aren't Christians, but for some reason have decided to be among God's people, pushing their own agenda, seeking their own greatness, and not concerned about how the way they live their life, the way they see, the way they act, harms the people around them. What you need to hear is that you are not unseen. God has not forgotten you. It has not escaped his gaze that there is one less sheep near the flock. I know there are times when it feels as though you're off in shadowy places. Maybe you're off in a place that sort of feels as though it's a shadow of death, the valley of the shadow of death. The shepherd is looking for you. The shepherd is calling you back. The shepherd knows right where you are and is calling you back. The shepherd desires you. That's the heart of the father here. But for, that's for some of us who've been wounded. Maybe you're in that situation right now and you need to hear that. The heart, the heart of the Father is that he sees you and he desires you to be brought back to the flock. But for the rest of us, we need to be able to sort of change the way we see the, so we can see how we've hurt people in the church. We need to be able to see how the way of our life may have been oblivious to the fact that people are being caused to stumble because of the way we've chosen to live. Our heart needs to be like the heart of God that those who've been wounded by the church, those who've been wounded by us, aren't to be left off on their own. Well, they'll find another church, they'll be fine, right? Oh, they'll, they'll be okay, they'll, they'll work it out. Life's tough, they'll get over it. But instead, to have the heart of the Father, to chase after them, to bring them back. For you and for me, that means repentance. 
That means confessing to brothers and sisters. That means spending time with the Lord in the presence of God, seeing those places of our heart, of our, of our feet, of our eyes, of our hands that need to be radically changed or just cut off violently, brutally, if that's what it takes. That we may need to go to people and say, I think I've hurt you. I didn't intend to, but I've hurt you. Or maybe I did intend to hurt you. I, I, I got carried away. I, I was letting pride or I was letting control or I was letting my own fear run the way I was living. And I hurt you. I need to repent of that. We need to have God's heart for those people. Now in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna talk about what it looks like when somebody sins against us or what it looks like whenever we're called to forgive those um, who've hurt us. And so we'll get there. But for today, I, for today, what I want us to be left with is that we need to be searching our heart to be able to see where have we hurt those around us? Where do we need to be on guard for the way we might hurt people around us? Where do we need to be spending some time in confession and repentance in the presence of God asking his spirit to reveal the things that need to be radically changed or cut off in our lives? I'd ask you to spend some time um, in prayer about that today. Um, we're gonna move into a song here in just a moment. Um, and so I'd ask you to spend some time in prayer either before or after that song. Uh, and as you make your way to the communion table, I just would remind you that communion table represents the fact that the, that the shepherd has come after you, that the shepherd um, was chasing after you, that, that you have a good shepherd um, who, who continues um, to guard over you, right? That because Jesus lived and died, was resurrected, that you and I um, have gotten the benefit of the breaking of his body, of the pouring out of his blood, that many might be saved. Let's pray together. Grace, Heavenly Father, you are good, and you're good to us. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see um, what, it, what it looks like for us to move from the world, maybe that we were raised in, that's full of temptations and difficulty, that's marked by corruption and brokenness, whose physics have their own sort of twisted um, direction to them. It would help us to see what it looks like for us to move from that world more and more and more into living as citizens of the kingdom. Lord, we're living this way. Where we're willing to sacrifice the way we live, the way we see, the way we act. Where we're willing to humble ourselves and recognize that it means that we ought to be low in status. That we, we, not to, we, we shouldn't be clinging to our own power, our own resources, our own influence, but instead we should be childlike in our humility when it comes um, to what it means for us to be citizens in this kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would, that you'd open our eyes to ways that, the ways that we've hurt um, people uh, who are part of your body. That we would see the ways that, um, the way we interact, that our own character flaws, that our own struggles and difficulties, that we, you'd help us to see how those ways um, of living uh, might hurt people around us. God, I pray that you'd remind us that you were a good father who loves us, that you'd remind us that it's grace that holds our feet to the ground. And so we can come to you with confession and repentance, with confidence, um, knowing that Jesus has made that possible for us. I pray that you'd give us the boldness to seek out those that we've hurt, to ask for their forgiveness, to repent in front of them. Not just because we want to make peace with them, though we certainly should, but because that's what it means for us to live in this kingdom, to be radically changed, radically transformed by the gospel that we might see that Jesus sacrificed his life to reconcile with us. It is a part of living, of following after Jesus to reconcile with those around us. Lord, we love you and we trust you. In your name we pray, amen. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more. darkness new every morn our sins they are many his mercy is more what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient on the not this sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore.
of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. Beneath the dead we could never for today is from number six and I just want to read this over you as you go into your weeks the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give and be gracious to you the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace you guys have a wonderful week we love you